<laughs> so have you uh you've been doing any turkey hunting at all this spring i just went to uh the the world turkey hunting championships uh not to hunt in the tournament just to have fun and kind of hang out and support it and did not get a turkey is that in kansas yeah that was in kansas so you you did hunt but you you didn't compete yeah i did hunt just for one day and uh didn't get one saw a few and they just weren't weren't kind of committing the last few feet i needed i heard that uh it was real tough weather wise as far as like high winds and cold still in kansas during that tournament yeah i think it was uh pretty rough it was real windy so i you know, I'm not a big turkey hunter, so I'm not that good at knowing what the conditions should be, and uh, it was evidently not good. Yeah, and it's you know it's been that way all over the country with everything's like behind it, with the weather down south. It started down in like Alabama and Georgia, and I and it's I, I was in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and the turkeys are like ten days late. You know, they this time of year they're breeding. So they'll have the hens with them early because that's what they're trying to do is breed as many hens as they possibly can. And the hens will get bred and then they'll go on their nest. Well, once those hens are on the nest, those gobblers will go around and check on those hens to make sure that they're cool and that no other jakes or gobblers are coming in there or predators and messing with that nest. And then they'll go out and breed another hen. Well, by the time we were in Iowa, there should have been 70, 75, 80% of the hens bred. But every time we would call or locate a gobbler, we would hear him gobble, and we'd be like, oh, we're on. And it was like a courtesy gobble, because right after it, you would hear a hint, Arr! she'd just mouth off and take him with her, meaning that Mother Nature has everything behind, and the hens weren't bred yet. And that's what was going on in Kansas, from what I heard during that World Turkey Championships, is that, one, the weather sucked, and two, Mother Nature was just off with the hens. All the gobblers were still hinned up. Yeah, I think uh, there was still quite a few turkeys that they got killed, they were pretty good. A few teams uh, got three or four. So did they really? Yeah. Wonder how they were doing it. I need to go get some lessons because I suck. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like we we got to spend some time together. And you were in Kansas, but just south of there, we were. You and I got to meet up with George Thompson from Benelli, right down at Flatline Outfitters in Oklahoma. And you, it was kind of one of your first waterfowl hunts, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah, it was my first waterfowl hunt. And, and only so far so now you when you, when a guy says first and only you know you can take that two ways like is it always going to be your only or did you experience something that would have you coming back again oh i definitely want to do it again it was uh pretty exciting and and not slow you know it's not like you're sitting in a tree stand all day and and seeing a couple deer walk by but you're seeing a ton of birds and having chances left and right to, to shoot at them. And you can, you know, with your personality, you, you know, in your career and, and guys, by the way, I'll just announce it now. We're, you know, this is Chad again with this life ain't for everybody. And I'm sitting here with the one and only Dan Hendo Henderson, pride fighting UFC. Um, you know, he's a friend of mine. It's hard to call a friend, a legend, but in his world, and I've seen it firsthand. He is, he's uh, for sure legend. And I know he doesn't like me saying that, but Dan Henderson um, to be here, it gave us goosebumps knowing that he was going to come on a hunt with us. And we're talking about that right now. So, you know, in Dan's career and Dan, you correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in a lot of fighting, a lot of people look to promoters, whether it was Don King and whether it was Oscar De La Hoya, De La Hoya was a little bit quieter. Don King was boisterous in the boxing world. Then you come into the MMA and you have somebody like the Diaz brothers, or you have McGregor that, that they get mouthy and they promote their fights by throwing water bottles and they get real controversial. It seems like to me in your career, I never saw that with you. And I followed you for a long time that it was just like, Hey, I'll, I accept the fight. I respect my opponent. I'm going to sell the fight based on what I've done in the, in the octagon in the past and in the ring in pride over in Japan. If, am I wrong on that? Or is that's how you were? You were always kind of just like quiet until it was go time. And then you would speak with your talent, correct? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I just never really, uh, was a shit talker or anything like that. Just always tried to, to speak with, with my, my skills and try to, you know, Obviously, if, if somebody's talking quite a bit of, of trash before the fight, and it makes it a little more entertaining for me and a little more motivating to go put my fist through his face. 
<laughs> so with that same with that same kind of mentality, you take it into what you do now. I know you have a lot of passion for the outdoors. And when I say the outdoors, I'm not just talking about hunting. I know you love to be with your family. You have a lovely wife and kids. Um, you're always in the mountains. You're always with the UTVs, the ATVs, the boats, on the water, um, barbecue and grilling, outdoor lifestyle. And when you compare duck hunting and what we did in Oklahoma with the camp life and the cooking and then in the blind with the camaraderie and the cutting up and the ribbon and the talking smack. And it's different than being in a deer stand or your back up against the tree for a turkey, right? Did you enjoy that part of the hunt to where they're the socialization part of it? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it was uh, right up my alley. It was fun. And, and, you know, it's, you're not sitting there having to be quiet forever, just a few minutes at a time and, and uh, hop, pop up and, knock them dead and uh you know it was fun to to be able to uh you know enjoy that a little more instead of uh you know kind of having to be patient all day you know which which i'm okay with too but uh it's just a different kind of hunt and i definitely enjoyed it and wonder when we're going again yeah and i can't wait to start talking about that did you have any idea though like there was a couple times during that trip where you and i would look at each other and be like there was seriously like four or 500 birds in front of us at a time. And did you, going into it as a new waterfowler or a rookie waterfowl hunter, you know, sometimes when a turkey comes in, there'll be one or two. When a whitetail comes in below your stand, there might just be one buck down there, maybe with a doe and toe or something. But when you have that many eyeballs on you, there was a lot of power in that. Yeah, the energy was cool. Oh, yeah, for sure. It was amazing at how many uh, and each little flock would come down. I don't know how many came down, but it was, you know, definitely giving us some shade for sure and with you when you see that the calling aspect of that and see how they work the decoys and they're they hear the calls and they turn and they come in they might make a false run in those peanut fields down there were you were you like wanting to jump up all the time or did you did you have a hard time with the way i was with how patient we were trying to be and get them as close or did, was it tough for you to lay low for that long no, actually, I, I kind of had took me a couple a uh, couple times to get the the timing of it right. I was I was thinking we were gonna let them all land and and, and then pop up all at once when they're already on the ground and and you, know, you kind of tend to like to get them right when they're about to touch the ground. So I wasn't ready the first couple times to to pop up when you yelled go, but I got the hang of it pretty quick, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, you were you there were several times where. We had opportunities to unload our guns. You know, you have two in the magazine and one in the chamber. And were you, like, what, the guns we used, those Benelli Super Black Eagle 3s, the dependability of those, you, you kept telling George, because George Thompson, who's a product development for Benelli, was there, those guns were slick. And you really enjoyed shooting that gun as far as the accuracy of it and the dependability. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was an uh, awesome gun. It was super light and... Uh, you know, no problems whatsoever. I mean, I felt like I hit, it was, we had a lot of shooters out there, but I felt like I, I nailed a couple myself. <laughs> oh, you know, more than a couple. Did, what, what about George? He's a cool cat, huh? Just... Oh yeah, for sure. No, it, it was uh pretty cool having him there. Kind of explain the, the mechanics of, of how the gun works on, you know, on the inside. Typically you don't get to know that unless you, you like to read about it or whatever, but it was, it was good to hear it from the guy that helped build them. And, when you left there, you you still had a communication with George. Are you a a, a loyal Benelli owner now? Like once since you got your guns, or is it one of those things to where it's tough? I mean, how could you beat that gun? Do you have that mentality or that thought process with it? Is it that good? Is it that good of a gun? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I uh, went to the World Turkey Hunting Championship, and and I didn't bring my gun. Even though I wanted to bring it, it was just uh, kind of pain in the butt to check it, and I made sure that they had a Benelli, the same exact gun that I just got there for me, So, which I shot or I hunted with it. I didn't really shoot anything out there, but we had a good time. Yeah, and when you were walking into camp that night at, in Oklahoma, and we were in a church. It was an old church, and you walked in, and it's, it's kind of uh, just like any other hunting camp. But there was a couple evenings there to where me and you got to throw down on the Traeger and in the kitchen. Is that part of your lifestyle or were you just doing that because I was? Or do you really like to be that man that gets in there and, and, and throw down on some grub and cook and prepare meals and, and 
be pretty creative with that with that part of your life no i absolutely like to cook and and after that trip i i got me a, a trigger also and and my wife loves it not necessarily because the food tastes good but because <laughs> i'm so excited about cooking i'm always doing doing it for her so have you let her cook on it uh she hasn't done a whole lot on it no I think that's one thing I hear a lot about Traegers is guys are like, dude, my wife never liked to go out and light the briquettes and never liked to turn the grill on. It was always a pain in the ass for her. But now with the Traeger, it's a simple just flick the button and turn it on and let it heat up. And a lot of guys are calling their, their ladies on the way home and letting them, you know, take control of it. So that I know you got in touch with Tyler and uh, you're, you're doing some stuff with Traeger now. But as far as the grill goes and, and having the confidence in it, like you're saying, that's what I love about it is that it's like that Benelli, that it's just like the food's done and it tastes good every time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I haven't I haven't managed to screw anything up yet, but it's, it's pretty simple. It's amazing uh, the type of things you can cook on it. I haven't uh, done pizzas yet, but I'm going to work on doing that pretty soon too. Yeah, I've done I've done the pizzas about three or four times now on, on different doughs and different sauces, different wild game toppings we've done moose we've done elk we've done duck and they're awesome i mean you get that like kind of a little smoky taste on it but it's a it's legit and um when we talked when we were talking in oklahoma you were telling me that you've ran with with brunson and uh, john and gina brunson and i'm a big fan of what they do and they're and, and how they you know really promote family in the outdoors is is that something that you see yourself doing with your kids and i know i know that you you're a father and you take a lot of pride in being a great dad is it something that you want to see your kids get into now that you're really starting to you know hunt, hunt quite a bit more yeah absolutely I, I have taken them on on different trips when they were younger but uh you know sometimes when they get involved in other things and i'm involved in too many things and life passes a little too too fast then uh you know i definitely need to take them on more hunting trips for for sure so. uh, yeah i think that i think that you have that mentality that mentor mentality to where i was talking to blue you know you remember blue the, yeah. the, our, our guy down in oklahoma and he was like dude i had no idea that somebody with that with what he's accomplished would be that down to earth and i think that you have that about you that you make people comfortable around you to where I think you're, you would have an easy time mentoring people, just like you do in the fight game at your gym down in, down in Temecula. I think that it's going to be an easy transition for you to be able to get these kids going. And I'm wondering, like, are you going to want to get them into waterfowl hunting or is it going to be a turkey and deer deal? <laughs> and the reason I ask that is because if you go on that hunt that we went on, you got, you got hooked. Oh, so I think, sure. I think it's an easy deal if you put them in that right situation. I think we need to get them into a situation where they get hooked on it like that and not just sit there all day waiting for a deer in case a deer doesn't come in. I don't. How are you looking at that? Well, I think I'll definitely want to take them on and get them involved in both, both types of uh, hunting big game and, and waterfowl and, and uh, you know, just being outdoors and, and being in that, that lifestyle I think is a big thing and, and – you know, it's a big part of my life, and, and I just uh, know that they, they love doing that, too. They ask me, you know, occasionally, you know, if they can go. And just with school and everything, they, they haven't been able to make certain trips. You know, my, my daughter that, that's out here with me right now uh, loves – that's what she wanted for, for her birthday was a shotgun, so. I love it. And she's a, she's a volleyball player in college, and she's athletic, and – studying right now and I, I can't wait when, when we're at dinner tonight I want to talk to her about kind of you know what she wants to see in her hunting career or in her shooting career which shooting sports right now are huge and getting kids involved in just like sporting clays and five stand and trap and things like that like I work with some guys in the 4-H and one of the fastest growing strongest segments of the 4-H right now which is relatively known as agriculture livestock kids raising pigs and cows and showing them is shooting the shooting sports, these kids with, I mean, I don't need, I can't even tell you how many members there are on the 4-H, but that's the fastest growing segment of the 4-H organization in America right now is shooting. So to see your kids getting into it, it's got to make you feel like this is awesome. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I guess it's, it's probably pretty quick, quickly growing because they'd rather pick up shells than shit, huh? <laughs> 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense if you start looking at it the agriculture way. But a little Dan Henderson humor. I was in the 4-H as a kid. I had a number of different animals. So, Did you ever win a ribbon? Yeah. Yeah, we had, we had sheep and, I don't know, all sorts of different stuff. Goats and all sorts of. So if I call your dad, I can find a picture of Dan, Dan Henderson standing there with a ribbon on a pig? Uh, I don't know about a pig, but a sheep. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to get off of Oklahoma yet because it, it's where I really got to see you. I mean, you're in your mid forties like I am and it took you back to, you were a kid in a candy store. We were fired up and there was times though, where because of mother nature again, we talked about it with the Turkey deal just now, the weather was warm. The, it was, it was really mild temperatures. And what that does in a duck's mind or a goose's mind is, hey, I don't have a lot of reason to go eat. Just like we as humans, if it's hot outside, we'd much rather have a cold drink than a big hamburger or whatever. Right. There were several hunts, few hunts anyway, that down to the wire and here they come. And we're literally looking at our watches going, hey, guys, four minutes, nine minutes, 14 minutes until shooting hours, whatever. I just said that backwards, but 14 minutes, nine minutes, four minutes until shooting hours are up legally. Right. And all of a sudden, here comes the flock. And we were there was times where we killed our four, five, six man limit in two flocks with literally just a couple minutes. minutes. Left. Yeah, I remember that. It was pretty. Uh, you know, I guess it was on its way to be a disappointing hunt, but still fun to be outside. Then all of a sudden, they come in the last few minutes, and and we're waiting for them to quit circling around so much to to get in closer to shoot, and and they cooperated just fine. And when that happens, it's like. I always try to compare it to a, a guy with your mentality, which I think your mentality is different than most individuals that I hunt with, meaning that you've had to prepare to excel your entire life in the way that you made your money. You had to train, 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 and then not just be in physical shape, but your mental capacity had to be in a way to where there's a lot of people that go into hunting and fail that it might, they might not be so apt to go in again. And those hunts that you think positive and you keep your, your focus and you keep your optimistic attitude, like we can, I don't, I don't like to say the word winning in hunting, but we can succeed here. We can have some success here. It's those guys that, but the, the guys that really drive me nuts are the guys that are, they get mad if mother nature doesn't cooperate. It's out of our control. And I think that with our group that we were just like, Hey, we're here, we're having a blast. And it paid off because the duck gods, you know, they blessed us with, the see in the show, it wasn't just about us being able to kill our birds, in my opinion. You tell me if I'm wrong, Hendo, that there was some power going on when there was groups of geese and ducks, three, four, five hundred at a time, and we waited them out, and we, we, we got to see what Mother Nature can do, and that I, I was so happy that you got to see that. No, it was absolutely amazing. It was uh, definitely one of the funnest hunts I've ever been on, big game or anything. Um, you know, and, and I would love to go back and, and do quite a bit more every year so definitely uh thank you for getting me hooked on that do you think that do you think that and i and i and it means a lot to hear you say thank you and you're more than welcome and you're more than welcome to always come on our trips you know that but blue and carson carson texted me yesterday and he's like hey i saw you you know i heard that your hand was coming up tell him i said hi i'd, lo I'd love him to come back and have you have you always been that guy that that is so humble to because I was in I've been in Vegas with you a couple times and it's not a secret Vegas is a fight town your face is known a lot in Vegas I'm sure it's you go to Japan it's probably even bigger over there but I've never seen a guy get and I've been around celebrities enough to understand what they put up with and not one time have I ever seen you push a guy away or not say yes to a picture or an autograph is it always been like that or has it ever become too much uh yeah i don't know it's always been like that i've, I've, ha I've always had the, the attitude and the motto that you know without fans i wouldn't have a job and that was 20 years ago you know and and i had that attitude and you know obviously as the the popularity of mma grew especially in the states it, it you know happened quite a bit more often but i always made time for everybody you know there's been exceptions where if i'm at an mma event and there's thousands of MMA fans there. Obviously, I can't get to everybody, and I'm supposed to be in different places where I got to say sorry. And, and uh, you know, but typically when I'm out doing my normal daily life and, and people run into me, it's no problem at all. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind that one bit. And, you know, I just i have always also 
had the attitude that I'm a normal guy. I'm just have had a different job that a lot of people saw, saw me do. So, yeah, I just uh, enjoy being normal. And, and that's what I love about it is that you say you're a normal guy, and I know that you are. I've been around you enough to know how humble you are and thankful you are for your career. I think you've been very blessed in what you've achieved. But normal guy in life, yes. But normal guy in the fight world, absolutely not. And the main reason I say that is because you were 47 at your last fight. Or to correct me if I'm wrong. 46. You're 46 years old before you so-called hung it up. And, and so called, uh, <laughs> well, what are you trying to say? Well, no, I, I mean, I trying just, to get me back. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think I could promote a fight, but at 46 years old, that's not normal. Hendo. Why, why would you take a fight at that caliber? And I know you're a badass, but why would you take a fight with what you've accomplished at 46? Were you, in, were you still ready to roll? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, it was, uh, it was a title fight that I absolutely, uh, felt that I should, absolutely was capable of winning and still capable of beating anybody in the sport. You know, it's just a matter of uh, getting the training done right and getting prepared. And that's what I think the biggest reason why I retired was, wasn't because I wasn't able to compete anymore with, with that level. It just started taking, uh, taking me away from doing other things I want to do because during training camp, I'm don't have the energy to after after training to, uh, to do anything but sit on the couch and and recover for the next day. So, you know, I I just started spending less time doing family things with my kids and wife and uh, you know, it, it, but I was still definitely capable of doing it and doing it right. Just uh, not the uh, the training part was tough to to get. You know, as as you get older, the uh, recovery and that, that kind of goes first, I think. And as far as your opponent that night at the, the last fight of your career, 46 years old, you'd had some history with him. If it would have been anybody else, would you have still taken that fight? To win the belt at 46 years old, and I still think that you won the fight, and I might be wrong, I might be biased, but I think, it, I think that the first two rounds solidified the fight. I'm not saying that you can't leave it up to the judges. I hate when I hate that it got left up to the judges, but I'm not going to ask you if you think you won the fight. But if it wasn't the man that you fought, you went to you were in England, correct? Correct. Yeah, I was in uh, Michael Bisbing's hometown. H hometown. And would if it would have been anybody else, would you have taken the fight just because of a it, it, title fight, or was it personal with him? Uh, no, I think. I think the biggest thing was the title fight. It didn't matter if it was him or not. It was the opportunity to, to leave the sport and, and retire with being champion. And, and uh, that was the one goal that I hadn't quite, you know, accomplished yet. I had, you know, won a UFC tournament, but, you know, not the, not since they started the belts. Uh, I didn't win a UFC belt. I won other various belts. But uh, that was the last goal that I wanted to accomplish. Didn't quite get it done even though I felt like I got it done pretty, pretty, pretty well, well. I think you knocked him down three times in the first two rounds. I could go back and watch the fight. And I mean, I, I get it. It's, it's one of those judge. It's one of those judged events to where you're leaving it up to three judges to say who won the fight. But to me, I think that what was said that night is that there was a lot of smack talk by that other side. And when you came out and did what you did again at 46 years old, I was just like, Man, he's not ready to retire. He's like he's ready to keep going. And I didn't I didn't know that you were going to hang it up after that fight, but the, you know, in rewind, you're 46. You rewind, you started doing this. You wrestled in college at Arizona State for a year. You wrestled at Cal State Fullerton yeah. for a year, but you represented the United States of America in Greco-Roman wrestling in the Olympic Games twice. Yeah, in 92 and 96. I started wrestling when I was five years old, so I've been competing my whole life. Are you a good wrestler? Uh, I don't know about now, but I was. <laughs> I know you are. So you're you Greco Roman. Um, so let's just clarify some things. And I'm a huge wrestling fan, even though I was not a, a a champion wrestler. There's different forms of wrestling at both the collegiate level, the Olympic level. You have freestyling. Yeah, in the Olympics, you have freestyle and Greco Roman wrestling. Freestyle is similar to the, what you see in high schools and colleges. The scoring's a little bit different, a little bit different rules, but, you know, fairly similar. But uh, 
Greco, you're not allowed to use your legs for offense or defense, more just to, to get around on. And, and uh, you can't grab his legs. You can't trip him with your legs. And it's a lot of throws and, and uh, you know, a little bit more. Um, I don't know. It was both both freestyle and Greco are tough sports. And in my opinion, the, the toughest sport to grow up doing. And, and you know, it was uh, – Greco was just a little bit more challenging, I felt, and that's kind of what drew me to do that. Now, when you when you see your the way that you're built, um, and I don't know a lot about Greco-Roman wrestling, but back in the day when you were doing it at the Olympic level, were you small for your weight division, and were you small as far as the the typical Greco-Roman wrestler would look? Because when I picture a Greco-Roman guy, I picture the big Russians that are gigantic. Am I way off on that, or were you normal average size for that? No, it's probably average size. I mean, there was guys bigger. There was, you know, I, I'm i kind of more dense and weigh a little more than I look like I weigh just because I think uh, genetics play a part in that. But, yeah, I'm pretty strong for my size. And I think just because my muscles are just super dense and, and I weigh a little more. But, you know, it, it's – done well for me so i'm not going to complain about anything so no and you 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 represent the united states of america in two olympic games in 92 and 96 your first mma fight was in south america are you sitting at home done with wrestling or was it in between the olympics i know you got a phone call and you you went down to brazil right how did how did the mma deal start for hendo uh well Randy Couture and I had been training partners in wrestling for years, and then we always talked about how it'd be be fun to try MMA. And you know, but when when the UFC first started, what we saw on TV is is guys, you know, big old three hundred and fifty pounders fighting three hundred pounder. You know, there was a lot of big guys out there, and yeah, you know, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, but. Randy called me and said, hey, you want to go fight in this show in, in Brazil? He was going to fight in the heavyweight tournament. I was going to fight in the, they called it a lightweight tournament, but it was under one, I had to make 176 or something like that. And at the time I was wrestling at 180 and a half pounds, which was a pretty good weight cut. So it would have been an even tougher weight cut for me. But I said, uh, sure, why not? And it was about three weeks before the, the event is is when I got the call and never did anything like that before. Just a wrestler went down there and competed. Randy, uh, in the meantime, got a call. He had already put an application in to fight in the UFC and they turned him down and uh, somebody got hurt in the a heavyweight tournament that they were putting on and they called him up last minute and said, hey, you can come fight here if you still want to. And he went out and, and won the heavyweight tournament. And I think it was a week later, in uh, I won a lightweight tournament in Brazil. So you you literally are, I wouldn't say a couch potato, but you're in between training. Right. You get a call from the, the natural. I mean, Randy, Nicur Randy Couture is a UFC, MMA, wrestling, United States wrestling legend. Right. Um, you literally just get on a plane and fly to Brazil and you win your first MMA tournament. Yeah, basically. I mean, I, I practiced a little bit of it for two weeks. Was there such thing as what we call today the H-bomb back then? <laughs> Was there some right hands landed in Brazil? Uh, not not like, you know, it took me a while to figure out where to put it. I probably had the power back then, just no technique to figure out where to put it and how to set it up. And, and definitely uh, was a learning curve with that. But... Um, yeah, I think uh, the first guy I fought was a, a black belt in, in jiu-jitsu and wasn't all that great of a wrestler or striker and just kind of controlled uh, it a little bit and ground and pounded him. And it was a, it was, I made a lot of mistakes. He, you know, he mounted me and ended up being on top a couple times after he swept me. And, you know, I, I ended up back on top of them, raining down some, some ground and pound and they stopped the fight. And uh, it was almost uh, a riot there because they're not used to referees stopping the fights. It was right when they were trying to clean the sport up a little bit more. And down in Brazil, they're used to letting it go until the guy can't get go anymore. 
So that was a little bit ner- nervous. It made me nervous a little bit watching the crowd try to get in the cage. Luckily, the, the cage walls were about 10 foot tall, so it was a little tougher for him to get over. So it was literally a riot almost. There was uh, 50 to 100 people rushing the cage trying to throw, they were throwing stuff. And I know one of the referees or, or ring guys were holding the gate so they couldn't get it open. Really? Yeah. Sounds like something that would happen with Vince McMahon in the WWE, like one of those uh, steel cage matches. That was my first fight ever, and I wasn't sure if they were going after me or, or the referee, but they they did uh, they did offer to restart it to the guy, and he said, no, we need to respect the referee, and, you know. I, so that was, that was kind of cool to, to see that happen. And, you know, my next fight that night um, was against another American wrestler, and, and – he uh, shot a double leg in on me real quick, and, and I choked him in a front headlock. That I've never done a guillotine or anything like that, but I did an arm in choke while he was standing, holding me up. He passed out cold, 20-something seconds. So it was, that was an interesting one. So the legend of Hendo is born that night, pretty much. Yeah, it, uh, that was. I had a good time doing it, but yeah, I remember the the first time going in and they shut the cage door and I'm like thinking to myself, the hell did I get myself into here? You know, I knew nothing about the sport, but you know, being the competitor, they just had to say go and and off we go. You start wrestling at five years old. The discipline of wrestling is kind of like the mentality is, is it what I compare to a lot is the respect of, of the martial arts of, you don't just go and pick fights. Were you a street fighter? Did you learn how to throw fist when you were young or was throwing the, the, the rights and lefts? You don't do that in wrestling. So no. is it something that you had to pick up right there later on in life to become an MMA fighter? Yeah, I never, I think I've been in three street fights in my life and, and uh, never really threw punches and had to learn it kind of on the go there. I had, I hit pads for, and bags for a couple of weeks and then went down there and, you know, and did okay, and I didn't even start sparring until a year later after I fought in the UFC. I started sparring before I went went over to Japan and, and fought over there. So I never never sparred before after even fighting in the UFC. You so UFC came after after Brazil. You got invited. What was it? Was that mixed in with Couture too? Did he help you get started with that? Uh, no. Well, it, it was just uh, we we were training together. So yeah, I mean. It was, uh, he, he was, uh, I think had fought in the UFC before that and then was going to fight after that and then asked me if I wanted to do, so I did a tournament, two fights in a night down there. 200 pounds, I think was the weight class, 200 and under. UFC 17, I believe. 17, and let's, let's just talk a little bit about that time. And I think we're at UFC like 234 or something now. Yeah, something and like they have that. them every week. It seems like now right, it's they different. Don't, they don't even ca- they don't count the the ones on Fox and and they don't Fox count sports the, now. The, the pay per view ones are the ones that get the number, right. and then the fight nights have a different number. Right. Um, back in the day, when Hoyce Gracie, who was a pioneer of the sport, he won UFC one. And that was more of a Grand Prix style that you were just discussing. Like you had several fights or multiple fights in a night. That's how the UFC was at the beginning stages too, right? Right. Yeah, correct. Yeah, Hoist uh, was one of the ones that helped get it started in the U.S. here. And uh, his family started the UFC with with some other, you know, uh, partners to, to back them. But, you know, they did a pretty good job getting it started. I just don't think it was marketed the right way to begin with in the U.S. That's why I kind of had a, a time in the middle of there. Well, now it'd be towards the beginning, but right after I fought in the UFC and UFC 17, they kind of, you know, were getting backlashes of uh, getting dropped off a of cable and getting banned in certain states because it was just marketed as a spectacle rather than a sport. And... <clears throat> There was no weight divisions, right? No, there. Well, there was when I fought in the UFC 17. They had, but that was probably they just started doing that. But there was it was heavyweight was unlimited though, and and they didn't really care about 
it was just matching people up, so it didn't matter. And that's how it was when I fought in Japan too. They they didn't they weren't they weren't worried about weight classes so much with the matchups. Because when you see somebody like Dan Severn walk into the octagon, and then you have Hoyt Gracie, first of all, it looked you know mismatched physically. He comes in with the gi on. Dan Severn's in his wrestling shorts. He's an All American at Arizona State. You know he's a wrestling legend. You you would just never expect that to happen again to where a 170-pound guy is fighting a 250-pound guy, and that's kind of some of the things that were going on. I don't know what Hoyt's weight exactly, but that's when it became, started to get you know kicked out of certain states, outlawed in certain states, dropped from cable. They had to get a little bit more uniform in it, and that's kind of when the Fertitas came in and bought it, or when did, how did all that happen? Yeah, it was shortly after that that the Fertitas came in and bought it, um, and – I think the biggest thing that needed to happen was just to have a a, a unified set of rules and, and start being legalized by the athletic commissions. And, and you know, people just go and have shows. You, you know, it wasn't legal. It wasn't illegal. It was, it was kind of a lot of gray area in, in a lot of states. And they would just put on a show. It wouldn't have to be regulated by any athletic commission. I think, you know, the athletic commission, you know, it, it's, it's a good thing that they help basically make sure that it's safe for the athletes to, and the athletes don't get taken advantage of. So once they started getting a, a regulation with different athletic commissions and a unified set of rules, I think that's when it started having that persona of a, a real sport. And now, I mean, you could arguably say when you say, quote, unquote, a real sport, is the UFC and and the advancement of MMA was it the 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 force behind boxing almost in my opinion going away and and I'm not saying that boxing is still not awesome that there's not great athletes doing it but we I, would you agree with me that it's it's few and far between to know the name of any title holder in, in sanctioned boxing these days? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it definitely hasn't helped the sport of boxing, but yeah, I think it just back in the day a lot of people had the mentality that boxers were the toughest guys in the world or the best fighters in the world you know and me growing up as a wrestler i knew that wasn't true you know if i fought a boxer out anywhere i'd take him down and beat him up but nobody knew that they always had they, they always thought that he was the best fighter in the world if if he was a boxer and the champ and once MMA kind of took over and, and people saw MMA, they kind of had a different perspective of boxing after that. They, they just would say, well, but a boxer couldn't compete with an MMA guy for the most part. And uh, I think a lot of people have that attitude now for sure. And, and yeah, so boxing, no, it's not dead. It, it It's just a different perspective on it. It's, it's one aspect of what is in our sport. Are you a Mike Tyson fan, Dando? Oh yeah, absolutely. As a man and as a fighter, like he's uh, he's always around the UFC now. But it, being a fight fan like you are, um, I, I talked to Mendez about that. He was just fun to watch. Like, oh, absolutely. You know, he 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 brought it. You know, uh, for the most part, it was only one fight where he kind of was a little too hungry during the fight against Holyfield. <laughs> took, a, took a couple bites out of his ears, but I, I thought you were going well. Hungry against Buster Douglas? No, hung over maybe not. Yeah, hungry, no. But... no, I mean I think Tyson, especially uh, you know before he got in trouble, was was awesome to watch, and and you know obviously he had a lot of stuff he was dealing with, and a lot of people in in the sport of boxing that probably were trying to take advantage of him all the time, being in the position that he was. It, it was just a different beast than, than what I was even uh, subjected to in MMA. It's not like that. And bef before I go back to UFC 17 and the, the legend of Hendo being born in, in Brazil and then going to the UFC, with, with what happened last year, last August, when when we had these uh, these little fight press tours with, with Mayweather and McGregor, what what – did that do for the sport? In my opinion, as a fight fan, I thought I took it all 100% as a joke. And the reason I did is because no matter what your feelings are personally or looking at Mayweather and how he presents himself and how he can, he holds himself in public, 
you can look at it either way. I know he does some good things, and he's also known as a loud mouth. It's very arrogant. Da, 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 da. But at 49 and 0, never really lost a round, maybe a few rounds, and that's you know that's argument. Sugar Shane Mosley, Oscar De La Hoya, he had some brawls, but he's 49 and 0. Rocky Marciano was 49 and 0. I looked at it as a disrespect even more to boxing now, and I know Dana and everybody was pushing this fight. But there's no way that Conor McGregor deserves to be in the ring with somebody like Mayweather never having a professional boxing match, in my opinion. Now, selling the fight and doing what McGregor does and earning the money and the pay-per-view and all that they did, fine. But what, was that good for anything? I thought it was a joke from the get-go, and I really thought that, that it, during the actual nine rounds or whatever it lasted, that Mayweather kind of just danced around and could have ended it at any time. Was I seeing it wrong, or was that a legitimate fight? Well, I think they legitimately fought. I think it, Connor had zero chance to win, or point zero one chance of winning. You know, I think he hits hard, and I think uh, obviously because it's Mayweather's sport, and he has all the reputation to lose, and and McGregor had nothing to lose. It's not his sport. He's fighting the best in the world and the hardest guy to hit in the sport. You know, I think that's why. I don't know if Mayweather was dancing around. He's not known for knocking guys out. He's known for adding up a lot of punches and shots and finishing guys that way. And and I think he just wanted to uh, get McGregor a little bit tired and, and less dangerous before he went in and started actually fighting him. And that's why McGregor ended up winning uh, a few rounds there. And, and you know, he, he, I think he... He had a good showing, but it that wouldn't have mattered. I mean, he wasn't. There's no chance of his, him winning that fight, even if they fought again. You know, and McGregor boxed for another five years and then went in to fight him again. There's no chance. It's just not his sport. And and if you add one little aspect of MMA to it, if you you let McGregor throw kicks or elbows or anything different, or clinch and punch. You know, then it's a different sport. Then it's a different game. How different? Oh. Not how is it different. I get that. But does he win the fight easily? No, oh, I think uh, if you add one aspect of MMA, McGregor would have demolished him. Really? Oh, yeah. It's a different beast. I mean, it's, it's you know, if, if you can hold on to somebody and, and beat them up, take them down and still throw punches, throw kicks, it just changes it quite a bit. So, just yes or no, in one word answer, was that fight good for combat sports in the world? Yeah, I don't think it was bad. I mean, I, I don't think it, it helped uh, boxing much, but I think it helped MMA. To get the word out there? Yeah, and just, you know, the, you know, because I, I, I do think Connor had a good showing, but mostly because Mayweather was, I think, being careful. With what just happened in the news in the last couple, in the last couple of weeks, the month with McGregor and the fight team and the things that went down in Cleveland, the mentality to promote a fight, I think, went too far. I don't know that all the the details of that, but does that black eye a sport like MMA? And does that is that a, a media stunt, a publicity stunt, or is that bad when you see the spokesperson, one of the faces of MMA, one of the faces of UFC? have that kind of behavior is that is that bad for the ufc no i i think it's bad i think it's 100 percent bad i think uh he should be definitely fined uh quite a bit and and you know i'm, I'm surprised after getting arrested like that 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 immigration didn't kick him out of the country and send him back to ireland i mean i think it was uh, especially a sport that that i've helped grow and build from from a long time ago till now and, and to have somebody like that kind of disrespect that and, and just disrespect people. And, you know, he's just gotten super arrogant. He was always arrogant, but he went to a different level. His head got bigger and he thinks he can do whatever he wanted whenever he wants. So he just doesn't respect people, laws or anything. Hence the reason why I think the whole Mayweather thing was a joke because you make $150 million in a fight to where you never had a chance and really have no business being in there to the point to where I don't think he could have beaten the, probably the top 10 ranked fighters in that weight division that night. In my opinion, I just see a different thing to where I understand selling a fight, but 
that guy, he threw some stuff through windows that cut people up and ha he put that, could you imagine the fear in that bus driver's heart going on when he's got all these quote unquote tough guys that are, uh, and then this things come flying through. I mean, it, I was just looking at it like, man, dude, just control yourself. Uh, yeah. He just comes off as this, you know, pretty big idiot. And yeah, it's it just disappointing to me and pisses me off that somebody like that just kind of, uh, puts a black eye on the, on the oil sport and, and something that I've been passionate about helping grow and build and, and around the world, not just in this country uh, and making the sport what it is, you know, it's, it's, you know, he's not doing a good job walking uh, down the road that, that guys like me paved. Yeah. And you say it's in, in the hum and the humility that you have, I, I look at it like if they, what if Dana brought him back and the new owners of the UFC and when they bring him back and he does his little apology and then he gets his new fight announced there's there. It's just like there's, he's going to have the Irish crowd and the fan base back into it. But I look at it like, man, this guy doesn't deserve to come right back and, and, and do that. He put people's lives in danger. And I hope that the sport respects that enough to say, Hey, you're going to pay for this. If John Jones can do what he did being, being very, undisciplined in my opinion because to me he's got all the talent in the world i switch gears there a little bit to john jones and i you you've been a you've i've had conversations with you about john bones jones before this guy doesn't need to do performance enhancing drugs but he cho cho chooses to do so during training camp test positive after he embarrasses cormier and did what he did to him i look at it like I don't want to see you fight anymore. Even though I was a fan and I, not that I know John Jones, but I had his back. I'm like, no way. There's no way he's, he's taken perform. He doesn't have to. Am I right on that? You don't have to do all that extra shit, right? Well, I think, uh, your mental attitude is, is a tough thing to have in the right, in the right place, you know, to, to be that confident in yourself, to not question yourself and in, in your training and, and everything else. And, and guys that don't, quite have that mental attitude you know think well shoot I, I need to do this in order to compete and you know John Bones he, he didn't need to do that in my opinion either but obviously he kind of did and, and I think uh, ruined his legacy you know you don't know how long he's been doing it you know he's only got caught after they started doing uh, much more stringent drug testing and and you know, Anderson Silva's right up there with him. That's you know, so he, he testing positive a couple times and, you know, just ruins uh, the legacy that he built and, and the the whole, both of them were right up there for best of all time. And now you wonder if that's the reason why they were the, the one of the best of all time. And that it, it almost kind of puts it in, and I know you just came off a little road trip to Nashville and St. Louis with your wife and you were at Bush Stadium watching the Cardinals play. And it takes you back to that stadium quote unquote steroid air, the asterisk air of home run hitters in the major leagues. Yeah. And at that time in, in St. Louis Cardinals history, Mark McGuire, who started with Oakland and then was with St. Louis, you know, he he's hitting 70 home runs a year, whatever, and then Barry Bonds breaks the record, da 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 da. It's same thing. You don't know how long they were doing it. They got an asterisk by their name. They're selling out stadium after stadium, and there's different ways to look at it. You know, was it known that they were doing it, and that's the reason that all those asses are in those seats and all those jerseys are selling because the ball's flying out of the yard. But now all of a sudden it comes down to where, oh, no, you guys, nothing you did counts. And that's the mentality now with John Jones is like, I don't even, like I look at Cormier to where like Cormier got beat that night. And I think Cormier is, I don't know him. I don't know if I agree with the way he is all the time, but one thing's for sure. He never says no to a fight and he always gives us all in my opinion. And I think he got embarrassed that night. And it was just like when McGuire's hitting all those home runs, what, what credit do you give somebody when they take it that far to, I guess it's cheating. It's cheating, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely. Uh, that's the reason why it's illegal. Cause, cause, it is cheating and, and it's not healthy to do. And uh, I think everybody should be on the same page with that. And, and I think on that same note, you saw it and, and, you know, is going back even to Olympic games and retesting, retesting blood and, and urine tests from, you know, Olympics ago. Now that, they have different technology now to, to really? test for more things, and they're taking medals away from people. So Carl Lewis might lose his medals if he was doing steroids? <laughs> well, 
I don't think it'll go that far back, but oh, well, it won't go that far. So you're talking like mid nineties to present or uh, even more in the two thousands, probably. I think, you know, from what I hear that, that some people are, are losing medals now. So you fought in John Jones weight division. He yes. fought in yours, I should say. Yeah. I I apologize. He he fought in yours. Let's say Hendo versus Bones, title fight, UFC two forty five, da 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 da. You go in there and you're one of the baddest ass fighters in UFC MMA history. You give it your all. You land a couple of H bombs. You knock him to the ground a couple of times. He lands a couple of spinning elbows on you. The judges give him the fight. It's they, it, it, maybe it's a he gets one ten to eight round. I don't know. You find out after the fact that he's cheating, your mentality is that you are pissed off. Cormier has every right in the world to be like, dude, that is the biggest. Remember all the stuff that Cormier would say about him in the press junkets and the press conferences and everything? He would. He was dead on right. How pissed off would you be if you were in his shoes? Well, he's he's in a bad spot. I mean, it, yeah, obviously he lost the fight and lost it pretty badly. And uh, to have the guy test positive after that is is you know i guess it gives you a little bit of uh justification back but it it's still embarrassing for him i mean where does he go now does he just go back and take the belt that he you know got beat does he have it fight? yeah i think you know they, they they didn't give it to john jones obviously so now the big fight coming up is cormier versus the the, the heavyweight, heavyweight champion of the world yeah. um and i can't pronounce his name can you help me <laughs> Can you pronounce it? He's from Cleveland, but he's he's got he's he he's a badass. Oh shit! Sorry, <laughs> you're all right. He's a badass. So that's they're fighting for which belt? Do you know? Uh, yeah, Miocic. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, it's for the heavyweight belt, and so Cormier would have the chance of having two belts. Also, does he have a chance to fight to beat this man? Uh, I think he he his if he remembers, he's a damn good wrestler, and his conditioning is good enough to take me a chick down every round. Yeah. But I, I don't, the I mean, chick's got decent wrestling also, and he's bigger. It takes a lot of energy to take somebody down and especially somebody heavier. Um, so yeah. I, and me chick's got power and he's, he's very good backing up landing punches. And, and that's what he's going to have to do to kind of keep his distance from, from Cormier, you know, I think Cormier definitely has a chance, but not a big one. So you're you're picking the winner of the fight to be just the belt will stay in the hands of Mia Check or however you pronounce his name. Yeah, but I mean, I'm looking for a good fight too. Are you surprised what fight. he did against Nagano or however you pronounce that guy's? Because that guy's a beast. Yeah, I mean, what uh, he did with Overeem or whatever. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I've been a fan of Mia Check for a long time. I, you know, he's since way before he was champ, I thought he was definitely good and tough and, and, you know, but some of those guys are big and strong and tough also. And, you know, I think he's shown mentally, he has the right attitude to, to be able to overcome certain things and, and get in there and, and show his skills the way he trained to do it. You've been a fan of him for a long time and the new Modelo beer commercials that he's starring in. Do you think that they're a legit story? Does he really still fight fires and kept his day job? As the UFC heavyweight champion of the world, I, I don't know if he, he's in there fighting fires now. It'd be kind of. I don't think his sponsors would like that or Reebok or. Hey, that's a good question. Is you were in you when you watch most of your fights in your career, except maybe the last two or three in the UFC before you retired, you had a whole slew of partners. You know, um, you had a whole bunch of sponsors that would. You know, back in the days where your trainers would 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 plop the uh, banner over the side of the octagon and it would list all, and then your shorts were loaded with them, and then your websites and da 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 Was that a good move? I mean, was that all f the uniform, you know, with the Reebok deal? And I remember when, like, John Jones came out one time and maybe GSP, they had Nike and Gatorade at one time. It prohibited fighters from going out and making extra income. Was it good or bad, in your opinion, when that happened? No, uh, it wasn't good for the fighters. Uh, obviously, they'd like to go out and, and make money. I think, you know, I, I understand what the UFC wants to do to try to make it a, kind of a uniformed look with, with the fighters and what they're wearing and, and, and the sponsors. But, you know, I, you know they're getting a lot more money out of the sponsorships than what they're giving out to the, the fighters. So it just wasn't exactly fair. 
um, you know, they could have done it a little bit different and, and a little bit more open book. And, uh, and probably the fighters would have been a lot more on board. You know, it was uh, obviously, I don't think there's hardly any fighters that were for the, the change, but, you know, we all do what we have to do and, and to, to keep in, in, in employed, I guess I should say. So, you know, it, it was what it was. And, and, uh, but I don't think it was a good thing for the fighters the way they did it. No. And were, were you with, when that happened and then the new ownership takes place, a new, um, capital group comes in and buys the UFC and it was all in the news public 4.2 billion, whatever it was, Fertitas make their money. Dana gets his cut. He stays on as a, an acting uh, employee of the UFC. Um, it seems to me like a lot of UFC fighters that that even young and and you know more mature fighters in their career have left the UFC to go to Bellator. Is it because of that sponsorship, it, or is it all because of the new ownership, or do you have any say in that at all of what's going on? Yeah, I don't know for sure. My guess is that you know that. It, Four point two billion dollars is a lot of money, and it leaves you a big monthly bill to pay to to pay for for whoever lent the money to them to to make that purchase, and uh, they'd rather not pay some of the bigger paid guys, and and uh, you know have these other guys that don't make as much fight instead. And no matter what, it's, they're going to get the same numbers that you know, and and they think. Uh, you know, some of the big names don't matter to them. And I think that's the attitude that a lot of the fighters don't like. They, they feel like, you know, they're, they're taken advantage of and, and not not paid what they think they should be paid. And that's they're getting paid more in Bellator. In Bellator, I don't know off the top of my head who their mother company is, but I think it's somebody like Spectrum or Comcast or some big, you know, cable company. Do you Do you fault anybody? for bettering their livelihood, bettering their ability to make an income to pay, for, you know, to provide for their family. Do you fault, fault somebody like you're going down to California to do an appearance for monster tomorrow. And it's in, in and it's in conjunction with the Bellator Grand Prix, which uh, uh, one of our local guys, a friend of ours, Ryan Bader's fighting the main event against King Mo in the first round, I believe. Do you fault a guy like Ryan Bader by saying, see you later, UFC, I'm going over to the Bellator, even though the Bellator might not have the stature, maybe they're trying to get that stature, or are they simply trying to pad their portfolio and pad their um, their their lineup of fighters to where Dana and those guys have no choice but to go in and buy them too, like they did with Strike Force, like they did with Pride, like they did with the WEC? Is that what's going on, or where does Bellator stand in your opinion? No, I think they're, they definitely are growing and growing their roster of, of top guys they have you know and, and i don't fault any of the fighters to go out and make money where they can and, and if they feel like they're not getting paid what they're they're worth then go out and get try to get paid with what what you think is a good fair price of what you're worth and i went out and did it after i fought bisbing the first time ufc 100 my contract was up and and left and went to strike force because i i got paid a lot more and stayed with them for a few fights, and and in that time, Strike Force was growing the same way. They were signing more guys and and uh, some of the the better guys, and UFC ended up buying them. Uh, you know, at, at the end of end of my my Strike Force contract, I think my last fight was under underneath Zufa ownership. So I have one question on that before I go rewind mode again. You, you're you saying that there's a chance that you would have never went back to the UFC if they didn't buy Strike Force potentially, because you were that's why you were naturally went back into the UFC mix is because now they purchased Strike Force, or did they come to you and have to give you a new contract under UFC? Well, they ended up putting me in the UFC and, and only keeping Strike Force open for a few more months. But, I mean, they did the same thing with Pride. I was in Pride, two champion two weight champion in pride and they bought pride at the time. And, and that's why I was in, you know, I can't say what I would have done or not. If, if they never bought pride, I, I might, might've still been fighting in Japan for 20 years. I don't know, but you know, it, it, it all depends. I mean, it just where, where your, where your value is and where people are going to pay you for that value. And, and, you know, I was getting paid a lot more in strike force. So I went there and, and 
you know, they, they put a lot more focus on, on me and, and they have less bigger name guys. So it was a big, a good idea for me. Um, you know, I ended up fighting Fedor there. That was the one fight that was under Zufa ownership, but it was already set up before the, the purchase. So that was originally a strike force fight. And what happened in that fight? Um, it was a good one for me. <laughs> and I mean, he, Emiliano, or Emiliano? Emilianko. Emilianko Fedor was known for a while. He was like undefeated forever. And Yeah, he was probably at the time in pride was touted as the best fighter in the world, pound for pound, best heavyweight ever, um, a bunch of different things. He was the only fight that he lost was I think a, a no contest type of, of loss for, you know, having a cut or something, but you know, and he, he did lose a couple fights in strike force, um, prior to me finding him. Um, what, who was the first guy to beat him? He ended up beating Ver Verdun. Verdun. Yeah. Yeah. He just, I think he just didn't respect, uh, you know, Verdum's skills and, and, Got in a clinch. Just was beating him up. and No, it was on the ground. Just was beating him up. Got caught in an armbar. Oh, yeah, but Verdun was on his back, if I remember right. Right. And he got caught and tapped him out. You you met, you met mentioned something about you, you were at UFC 17, um, and then you leave. You you left. How long did you fight in the UFC when, once you started there? Just that one event. Just that one event, and then you're gone. Yeah, the, it was a, a one, one event contract, and that was it. And then yeah. we're... Then I went to Japan and fought in a 32-man unlimited weight class tournament. Okay, so this is where I was going with the rewind. Is that I remember in Oklahoma, like my jaw hits the floor when I hear this. Is there's 32 men in in what they called the Pride Fighting Championship? No, that was it. Was in rings. It was called the King of Kings tur uh, tournament. Was King of Kings. King of Kings, and is this, and what hap What happens in this tournament? Uh, you know, you fight two fights in a night. And you come back and fight three fights a night in the finals, and and uh, that was that was probably the toughest night of fighting I had was when I fought three night three fights in a night, what with the distance in all three, I I won the tournament. So you literally went from a Greco-Roman wrestler to Brazil after Randy Couture says, "Hey, let's try this." You go down and try it. You win that. You come back. The UFC calls you. You go in there and you win your first fight against UFC in the UFC you leave that after a one fight contract is up you go two fights in a night there it was two fights in a night yeah at UFC yeah won those and then you go to this tournament in Japan and you beat it's 32 men and you win so the, really the legend I mean if you if you build a movie this is kind of like the Hendo Rocky kind of deal is that this legend is building like now all of a sudden this guy that he represented the in the Olympics in America and Greco-Roman He's on this fight path, this course to where can he lose? And I know that you're humble to know that you can, and that's why you train so hard. But were you ever like, what's going on here? Because like all of a sudden you're becoming this like a prodigy in MMA when you really didn't even know how to throw a punch coming out of Greco-Roman. And you're figuring, are you learning as you go? Are you learning on the job while you're winning all these tournaments? Well, yeah, I think uh, as I was – train more and learn more that's what made it more exciting to me there was a lot more to learn and a lot more you can do than than just greco roman wrestling moves that you kind of get gets a little bit redundant making sure that you you do the same moves over and over to, to make sure you do them even per, more perfect than you already do them so it got a little redundant a little bit boring and mma w was uh pretty exciting to me to be able to learn new things and it was fun to punch somebody in the face too so were were you were you in Japan that night when you're walking down? Is it is it the crowds that I'm used to seeing? We had Scotty Lego who was an Olympic snowboarder in here the other day, and he won a big air contest in the Tokyo Dome, and it's like fifty thousand Japanese people with their flags and they're just boisterous and loud. Was it like that? Are they huge fight fans over there? Yeah, I, they regularly had forty to sixty thousand fans at. at pride shows and and i think the most i fought in front of was like 70 something seventy three thousand or something like that in tokyo dome rampage uh i didn't i didn't fight him there i fought him in the ufc he fought him in the ufc yeah so he was in pride though right yeah he was in pride and uh did did fairly well had some couple uh big big fights and big moments over there for sure 
who am I thinking of that you was it the axe murderer or was that's it, Vanderlei Silva? Yeah, you beat him in Pride, or you fought him in Pride? Fought right? him twice in Pride. Yeah, my very first Pride fight was him, and and uh, don't tell me you won that too. No, I lost that. That was my first loss actually. So, um, he was a big monster looking guy, and and juiced out of his mind looking. I'm not sure if he was or not, but they didn't test for that over there. So. They didn't. No, and and uh, why didn't you do it? Why didn't I? I, I just it's never been my mentality. Is that the way your dad raised you? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's never been my mentality to do that. So you come back, you get a rematch with him right away, or did you have to fight your way back up? No, I didn't have a rematch with him for over five years, and he, when I fought him the first time, they they didn't have a belt in Pride yet, but once they had a belt, he was the first champ at that weight class and and uh i came close to getting a title fight with him once or twice and uh would lose, always lose right at that key fight to to get that title shot and uh you know ha- had the opportunity i think i fought vitor the very first fight that pride came to vegas in, in the u.s i fought vitor at 205 i was the champ at 185 and uh beat him there and they had another event scheduled in, in Vegas and wanted me to fight Vanderlei for, for the, well, they just said, hey, we want you to fight Vanderlei. And I said, okay, I, I would love that, no problem. And then it wasn't until a week later that I said, hey, is that for a title? Because I, I didn't care. I wanted, you know, it was it was what it was. Because they would, they would have their champs fight non-title fights quite often if if it's against a guy that, that – either shouldn't deserve a title or just a, a fun matchup that the fans want to see and, and there are different weight classes or whatever. So, but yeah, it was for his belt. So I ended up, uh, taking that off his hands. How? How? Yeah. With a knockout. You knocked out the ax murderer. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, I, I broke my actual, broke my right hand in the first round and it knocked him out in the third with a broken right hand? Uh, well, I think the actual knockout punch might have been a left hook, but I was throwing the right hand the whole time. And, and, and I did follow up with two or three right hands, um, Bisbing style. How often do you get a gallon of your favorite flavor ice cream, which I assume is probably chocolate chip cookie dough or something? Do you ever <laughs> just get in your tidy whities with a gallon of ice cream and kick back in your lazy boy and watch these fights? Uh, I don't wear underwear. <laughs> Commando, whoa! But, but I TMI. Do, I do like ice cream, but I, 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 my my thing that I got away from ice cream, and I do uh, I eat frozen mangoes at night. It's like a dessert. Frozen mangoes. Yeah. But do you ever go back and get and do what we're gonna do a little bit of today? Because I watch your fights a lot. It's easy to find fights with. That's one of the good things about social media and our ability to find content these days. Do you, does it even matter to you to go back and watch that knockout against the Axe Murder or, or Rampage or the Biz? I mean, the, the fight that I love talking about more than anything was Biz being won. Do you ever watch them at all? No. No, I, I, I don't know. I just, I was there. I experienced it. Why do I need to watch it again? But, you know, I usually come back after the fight, watch it, make sure I, I learn from my mistakes and, and maybe focus on the things that I did well on that fight. And, and once I, once I do that, then I typically don't watch it again for years. So in between the five years that you fought Axe Murderer one and then Axe Murderer two, you didn't go back and watch the first fight to see what you did wrong. Or do you use it as a training tool? The old fights? Yeah, I use it as a training tool right after, but typically when it's fresh in my mind, after, after I fought the first time I'll, I'll watch and see what I did wrong. And, and then that's it. And, and then I'm just working on, learning and getting better when one so, of the things you're what go ahead sorry i was gonna say so no i didn't watch that again until i had a fight scheduled with him when you when you think of dan henderson in my opinion one of the highlights of my career of being a fan of yours way before i met you and i met you lots you know several years ago we we, we got to hang out at shot show class go and, and and you've always treated me awesome and that's why we i, I believe that we hunt together now and we b- developed a friendship is i knew you as the guy that landed probably the best punch ever in mma history on biz Bing. and the reason that i always bring it up is because 
he's talented he's evolved he's 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 won the championship i get all that but he's just a mouthy mouthy disrespectful it's like he wants to kick somebody in the teeth as much as they can to see if he can get a reaction out of him he never got a reaction out of you going into that first fight was he as mouthy back then as as this as this guy from england as he was as he is now or was he you know before your second fight was he always that mouthy yeah i don't think he's changed a whole lot you know i think he's still just as mouthy and and arrogant and uh you know but i think he's a little smarter he he's able or he's in the position to to pick his opponents better and that's what he's done the last couple of years it, it, who was it that just came? Was it GSP? That GSP, they, but yeah, I mean, I don't think he was expecting that out of GSP. Well, he was mal- He was just mouthy as heck going into that. Do you, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but do you respect him as a fighter? Do you like him as a man? Or are you just like, are you at your end of the rope with the Michael Bisbing deal? Or would you want to, if, they, if Dana White called you right now and said part three is coming up, would you go do it at 47 years old? That might be far fetched, but do you like the man, and would you fight him right now? Well, I'd need about six months to get get some of this gut off of me, the beer gut. <laughs> the beer gut. Uh, but no, I I respect him uh, in the way that he doesn't he doesn't portray himself a different way for TV and fans. He he is who he is, and and like me or don't like me, this is how I am, and and you got to like that. I mean, you got to respect that. You don't have to like it, but. You have to respect it, and and he's, as a fighter, trained hard, worked hard. He's always in shape and and prepares for his fights, and and you have to respect the the work that he's put in over the years. And, and, you know, beyond that, I've never really hung out with him, so I don't know how he is as a person outside of hearing him mouth off. So I probably don't have very many nice things to say. So when you look at this picture that I have up on on our big screen here, you are in a crouching position with your head down, looking at his belly button. Your right fist is cocked and and clinched up. The referee has literally no idea. What's that, Pat? Is that what's Pat? What's the referee's name? Do you know his name? Do you? Uh, know? That's. Uh, 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 Did I put you on the spot? Like, yeah. <laughs> I know who it is too. But so he has no idea what's getting ready to go down. None of these fellas in the front row. Bisbing definitely doesn't go. What's going through your mind right now? Do you know? that the H bombs getting ready to like in this guy's night or what, what, what happens as a fighter? Are you, are you setting up a combination right here? Tell me what happens going into a punch like this. Uh, well, I think I attempted to do this a number of times already in the fight. So, I mean, obviously you're always hoping that it lands just perfect and, and does its job. But yeah, I think I, I hit him hard a few times before, but not in the right spot. And, you know, and, and I, Typically, do the you know a, an inside leg kick to kind of get 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 them distracted and and step forward after my kick to to really generate power going forward with so, my punch. So the training ideology behind this is, as you're crouching to get into the H bomb position, your left leg comes off the ground for what you call the uh, inside leg kick, and that brings his attention. His inner thigh is getting kicked on his left leg. You bring his body down to get his jaw in position to to take to land this punch. Well, it's just more about bringing his hands down, or just to get him distracted. And and typically, you know, it's it's a hard punch to kind of see coming, especially if if things work out right like they did there. Yeah. So I, if I have Tom hit the play button. And this happens right here because you just said you don't watch your fights. Are you going to smile and smirk when this happens like I do? Or are you going to be just like, oh, that's just another day in the office? No, I'm going to smile and smirk. This is a, <laughs> this was a fun one to do. But I, I have probably seen this clip more than any other part, any other fight or part of my fights. In my, you know, I see this all the time. People like to post this little little clip on social media and everywhere. So this little knockout clip. I see quite a bit, but I don't watch. I haven't watched the whole fight in a long time. And a fight fan knows that this is not your best fight. This is not the fight that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. But obviously, this is one of the greatest punches ever landed in all the fighting, in my opinion. Hey, Tom, will you please hit the button? And here goes Michael Bisming one. Oh, God. <laughs> so did you 
have to do that, Hendo, the second part where you Superman through the air and just jack his jaw? Or was it, were you fed up with the mouthiness to where you didn't care? No, I mean, it, it, it wasn't about him. It, it wasn't personally at that time, but I ha- you have to make sure the fight's finished. And, and you don't know how he's going to react if he's going to lay there for, lay there for a quick second and, and, and then just put his legs up and, and act like he's okay, which is what happened the last time I fought him. I knocked him down and, and didn't jump on him quite as quick. And I, I swear it flashed through my head that, that I got some crap over this second punch on him. But, you know, and I didn't do it, and the fight went on, and I lost the decision. So, you know, I I, I didn't do anything that I wouldn't have done. Any, I did it to Vanderlei the same exact thing, but hit Vanderlei one or two more times just to make sure he was done before the referee got in there. And I was... I did that before the referee was in there. I was already trying to get up. Well, there was nothing unethical about it in the fight game. Or nothing the at all. Game. And I think what, what I think kind of had a little bit of controversy in what I said afterwards, it, you know, that, yeah, I, I knew he was out, but I wanted to shut his mouth up a little bit. The second one was just to shut his mouth up. But, you know, and being in the heat of the moment, you can't stop, you know, at all with that quick of a reaction to, to try to finish somebody. And you don't know if you do stop and don't follow up how they're going to react and, and recover. So do you, do you remember that fight as something to where you don't want to be known for that fight? It doesn't matter to you. That was just another fight. That's just another night in Dan Henderson's career. But, I've heard a lot of people say that that kind of defined the fighter you were in the, in the meaning, in the way of like, it was the mouthiest guy at the time in MMA who really hadn't proven himself at all. Talking to the, one of the trailblazers and pioneers who had more than proven himself, just mouthy, mouthy, mouthy. And then all of a sudden he can't talk out of that same mouth because his jaws broke for several months. I, I feel that that's one of that that's one of the greatest moments in UFC <laughs> history and not, not to kiss your ass or anything. I'm just saying like, you don't get to see that kind of punch landed very often. In my opinion, there's just not many of them. And you're telling me that you did it on it. You did it quite a bit. Well, I, I, in practice, I do it is what I'm saying. And, and that was one of my combos, but yeah, I, I uh, definitely enjoyed that. Was it called the H bomb when you landed it? Was it already termed the H bomb then, or did that term it no, the H bomb? No, it was uh, actually after I left UFC and went to Strike Force. Uh, one of the announcers there that that used to call the fights in Pride also uh, kind of coined it that, and and it stuck. I, I don't know how well I liked it at first. I'm like, yeah, oh, you're bringing attention to it, but look at you just flipping dudes around, dude. This that, that was in my first UFC. Uh, <laughs> Oh, look at the knees. To that the was head. in. The, that was the second fight of the night. This is the guy. Who was that guy right there? Car, uh, Carlos Newton. Matt Hughes choked him out. They had that double choke out. Did you beat yeah. Newton? Yeah. You beat Newton that night. Yeah. Do you? Okay. Tom just showed a clip at the beginning of this highlight reel. Um, you're walking out. Did it matter? What was your walkout song? And and did it did it get you juiced up, or did it were you already ready to fight? It didn't matter what you. Yeah, it didn't really matter back then. I, I don't even know what they played in Japan for me. Um, and then everybody I, was kung fu fighting. When I came back to the UFC after Pride, Dana had uh, picked Lunatic Fringe for me, and it was it was that song that was uh, in that old wrestling movie. Um, Vision Quest. Vision Quest. Yep. So. You know, and I wasn't, you know, fond of it, but it didn't matter to me. It, it was, it got you pumped up. It, it, it was a big energy song, but, uh, you know, my last seven or eight years, I walked out to Made in America from Toby Key. That meant, that meant a lot more to me and got me juiced up quite a bit more anyway. With your relationship with, with uh, did Bobby Pinson write that song? Yeah, Bobby wrote that song, so. Bobby Pinson writes Made in America. You're friends with Bobby Pinson. Is that how you get the song, or did you just start using it, and that's how you got to know Bobby? No, I, I, I that's how it worked out to me getting that song or walking out to it was uh, because of Bobby. So the song is all kind of like the way you live your life. 
I mean, it's kind of that mentality of, you know, keep your mouth shut, go to work, get your hands dirty, buy stuff that was made in America, you know, not all the time, but as much as you can support our troops. Right. Um, and that's how Bobby wrote that song. And, you know, Bobby's got unreal talent and songwriting, but if you had a fight right now, would it still be made in America? Yeah. And the reason I ask that is because I watch your travels and I pay attention to what you're doing. And I've had conversations with you. You love music festivals. That's one of your outs. That's one of your outlets to get out and enjoy time right. with your wife. And, um, you love country music, right? You were just on, I saw something. You got to tell me about this. You're actually sitting in the vo- the chairs on the voice. Oh yeah. You got to chill out on the, on the set of the voice and watch. Did, did that happen through Blake or how does it sound uh, like this happen? It was, uh, actually, you know, JT, he hooked me up. Harden. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, he hooked me up with, uh, one of Blake's, uh, tour manager guys last year. Cause I was at country thunder and, and, uh, didn't get to hang out with the mayor, but we went out to the voice last year and then did it again this year. Is Blake a cool guy? Yeah, it seems like it. I haven't really hung out with him outside of on that setting, so but he seems like he'd be pretty fun. Do you do you think that the mentality of country music today is it something that do you look into it as much as some people do with the quote unquote bro country or do you are you a big Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Merle Haggard, George Jones kind of guy, Chris Stapleton, Jamie Johnson, or do you like the new stuff? You like a mix of it? What's your style? I pretty much like all of it, the mix of it. I mean, obviously, I, I think all of us hear more of the, the more recent stuff coming out, but, uh, you know, love Chris Stapleton. Always, you know, throw in some of the older ones, but uh, more of the new stuff is what I listen to, but... Uh, you're not going to sit here and look at me from across this table and tell me that you listen to Florida Georgia Line. I, I do sometimes, Jim. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. What does Toby think of that? Does Toby have a say in this at all? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I asked him that. <laughs> I wonder what Toby would say. No, I think I think everything serves a purpose, and um, <clears throat> we kind of got off track on this, but you 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 have a an entire career wrapped around MMA fighting, and I watch you watch this and I, it's a highlight video. It's literally like sitting down and being around somebody like Mike Tyson or Mike Tyson has a DVD out there called Mike Tyson's greatest hits. You can watch Muhammad Ali's greatest hits. You can watch a lot of fighters to me. Like you got to be able to, you're, excuse my grandma. You have to be able to see something like this and just have a sense of pride that, your career was, it's amazing what you've accomplished in the fight game. And to hear you say you don't watch the fights, and I know they all mean something to you in one aspect or the other, but isn't this means for you to, like, just be like, hey, I'm the man. This is what I, <laughs> or it, you still are just like, oh, well, it was just, it was just work. Why can't you look at a, uh, why would you not go and watch this a couple times a year? Or put this on at your Christmas party, make sure everybody watched it. <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh I don't know. I just I'm 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 still looking forward and 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 doing things uh, in my life that that I want to keep doing and do better and and not really live in the past yet. I guess I'm not quite that old yet. Maybe after I turn fifty or sixty. Now you say moving into that part of your life. Are you looking to stay involved in the sport? Meaning, I know you do appearances and I know you're part of some of the the promotions, but are you going to manage fighters or I know you're training, you have a successful gym, like we said, down in Southern California, Temecula area. Um, you have the quest fight team. Yep. Yep. We have our, our team quest down there that, you know, a number of guys still fighting there that are doing well. And, but you know, I have my coaches that coached me, you know, doing the majority of the coaching there. I'm in there when I can, it's only, it hasn't been as much lately, but typically a couple of days a week, I'll, I'll get in there and, and coach and sometimes roll around with them. Okay. So going in that same direction, are you a fight fan to where you'll still buy a pay-per-view and watch the promotions? Do you still enjoy watching the, the fights? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I buy fights, a number of different fights a year. Uh, there's so many on, on free TV, just like everybody else that, you know, I sometimes don't buy the ones that, that cost money if there's not very many good fights on it. You're telling me that Dan Henderson has to pay per pay per view to see a UFC fight? You don't yeah, get absolutely. a you don't get a life pass? Unfortunately not. Oh, no. they gotta make this happen. No, it's not part of the well, it's it's it is our retirement deal. 
<laughs> so tell me <laughs> this for free. Tell me this, Hendo. If if t- day after tomorrow, Saturday, what fighter would you pick right now that you let's say that you wanted to watch a fight Saturday? Who would you want to watch the most that's fighting right now? Beside, you know, I'm not counting your career. I'm talking about current fighters. Who do, who's who's making you go, man? That guy. I want to. I don't want to miss a guy's fight. I don't want to miss around with this cat. Shoot, I don't know. There's there's a ton of different guys. I mean, I I like watching. I'm just just like other fans that that like watching uh, good fights. And anybody that goes out there aggressive and and puts it on the line and and you know isn't afraid to 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 scrap. You know, is a guy that that most people are going to be fans of and uh yeah i'm I'm, i have no problem paying for fighters to to watch fights that uh that i that do that so do you like do you like nate diaz yeah i mean i like i definitely like how they fight and you know they're they're good guys too sometimes they don't uh have the they don't do the smartest things uh, out there to represent the sport the best, but they've definitely have uh, helped build the sport and done a good job, you know, helping to promote it. If McGregor was fighting in the main event this Saturday, would you want, would you buy his fight? No, hmm. probably not. It depends on who he's fighting. I don't know. Couldn't, okay. I couldn't say that. What do you think of this cat they, that's undefeated or he's got like, I don't even know how many title defenses now. Mighty mouse. Johnson like is he the real deal at that weight division I mean is this guy like he has he ever even been tested his last fight he pulled off some ninja stuff where he was flying through the air like on a front flip and punched at the guy and then ended up with a front shot I don't even remember how he did it but the way he won that fight was spectacular are you a fan of his yeah absolutely I'm a fan of his he 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 doesn't talk smack he goes out and puts it on the line and and takes risks and and you know he's good at what he does you know i would like to see him uh venture to a different weight class though just come up a little bit why not you th- you th- you think uh he-, he maybe go up and fight mendez uh yeah i don't know if that'd be too big for him or not but you know that would be there, there's a lot of interesting fights that that could happen if you start mixing up some of the weight classes well, when you say interesting fights, I mean, we're going to break some news here and it's going to be broken before this, but you are getting ready to receive a, an accolade in your, yet another historic career saying that again, a legendary career in the fight game. You had a fight that's deemed as one of the, always in the top five. And I just saw some account now where it was the number one fight, um, fan favorite in UFC history, um, Dan Hendo Henderson against Shogun Hua who I pronounced Rua before, but you educated me. <laughs> this fight is getting ready to go into the UFC Hall of Fame as a Hall of Fame caliber fight. And give me some of the statistics that, that we're going to learn on this fight. You, The first one that comes to mind is you landed more power punches in the Hua fight in that one night than you landed in the rest of your career combined. Yeah, that's what I was told. I haven't uh, quite read read them myself yet, but yeah, they said uh, I landed more power punches in that fight than than I have in, you know, in my career. And same with Hua, he took more power shots than he ever did in his career, and he he also landed more than he has in his career. He's gotten more takedowns on me in that fight than. I think they they credit him with five takedowns in that fight, and and that's more than anyone in my career took him down. Did in you one fight? But did you mention that he wore more punches that night than he <laughs> would? It, and he's a he's a Hall of Fame caliber fighter. I mean, he was a champion. But he came from Pride too. Yeah, yeah, he came from Pride. He won a Grand Prix over there. Didn't have the Pride belt. Um, you know, but won the Grand Prix, which which had. You know, Vanderlei and everybody else in there also, and and, and he uh, he's definitely one of the top guys out there. That's why he was a UFC champ already prior to that. So you were scared going into the fight a little bit. You had to be, right? I mean, it's, no. it's Shogun Hua. Like, he's a Brazilian. What is his specialty? He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Right. Well, he's, he's a jiu-jitsu black belt, but a uh, Muay Thai specialist kind of. And, you know, he... You know, I, I honestly thought I was going to go in there, put pressure on him, hit him hard a few times, and and break him mentally. And 
try to finish him after I, I broke him and really after I put pressure on him, which is what I was trying to do, uh, I, which is probably why there's so many punches that were thrown in that fight that, yeah, I was really putting a lot of pressure on him. Ended up almost finishing him in the third round, and and, and uh, he mentally stayed in there and, and absolutely did not break and showed more heart than uh, than most fighters ever do. So, you know, he ended up being losing a decision to me, but it was uh, definitely a, an interesting fight after that. After I, I kind of punched myself out trying to finish him in the third and, and wore myself out and, and didn't have a whole lot of energy in the fourth round, and, and the fourth round was kind of close. He landed some good punches, you know, and we he took me down, I took him down, and and it was back and forth. And then the, the, the fifth round, we kind of got in a clinch, and he tried to uh, take me down and you know I tried to counter it and throw him and and we kind of landed on our sides and he scrambled up on top before I did and I stayed there the rest of the round he mounted me most of that round and he he didn't have anything left on his punches and he wasn't I didn't ever feel like I was in danger of being stopped at all which is why I think it was a lot more exciting watching it not knowing what's going through my head and what what I'm feeling. So the fans definitely got a little bit more excited about that than I did. So you're, you get mounted in the fifth round and you, you're not getting up. Is it already in your mind that you solidified the victory or were you just so taxed at that time that you couldn't get up? Well, I think of both, you know, I think even if I hadn't known in my head, well, you know, I don't know, that might have changed things, but knowing in my head that I knew I won the first three rounds pretty solid, you know, and, yeah, you know, I still didn't want to stay there, but I may have had the, the energy. It might have gave me a little more energy knowing I had to win that round to get up, but, you know, I tried to get up a couple times, and he just mounted me again. How how does – and I – I don't know if really if people really put into perspective the, the the pain that is caused on a man's body um, with a fight like that Shogun Hua fight, or the way Bisbing felt after this punch we just watched. How does it take a day to recover after a fight like that, or what what is a normal day or a normal recovery period for after you you, you go into that five round battle and you win that fight? I know that you're on a natural high because of the victory. But when you wake up the next morning, besides the hangover, is the body in so much pain that you, you don't even want to go back in there? No. Well, I mean, for me, I think you know, my muscles were definitely sore because it was a 25-minute real intense and a lot of intense punches thrown and uh, throwing a lot of power. Obviously, it's like you know doing a, a, a really hard weight lift for 25 minutes without stopping so you know I, for me it was my muscles were a little bit sore and, and uh, I I just uh, jammed my thumb I think that was about the, the worst thing I had on me so but your body doesn't like you don't have to like go get stitches and, and check for concussion and like what's what what your body's got to be just smoked after something like that no I don't think I had uh, I don't think I was cut in that fight he, he was it was a very very bloody fight he got cut pretty good on the first punch I threw and and uh yeah I don't I don't think I was cut but my my face uh, definitely showed that I was in a fight do you do you think that that fight is worthy of the Hall of Fame if you were a voter or they got this one wrong or is that literally a Hall of Fame fight is that your is that your best fight of all time that you were involved in in your career uh, I think it was probably one of the most exciting fights in my, of my career for fans to watch. Absolutely. But you know, for, for me, there's other fights that probably mean more based on, um, beating guys at certain times, uh, that, that in their career that, that you know, felt like it was a much bigger accomplishment, but you know, he, that's right up there with the top ones. And then, you know, I think because it was such a fan favorite fight, I ended up fighting him again a couple of years later, which for me, that one was probably more exciting for a fan than, than the first one. I don't know, but 
They both were pretty good. What fights. happened in part two? Uh, part two, first round, I think, uh, right at the end of the first round, I heard him and, and kind of rushed in to, to try to follow up on, on, on hurting him and got caught with a punch and, and don't remember the rest of that round. It wasn't much time left in that round, but made it through that round and then got dropped again in the second round and said to myself, well, I'm just going to recover here and hold on top, be on bottom and hang out for a while and, and then get my ass moving because I've only got three rounds left and I've lost the first two. So, And then I knocked him out in the third round. <laughs> I love how you just say it's so casual. like, And it, you talk about it. I like talking to you about fights, and I know that you're humble enough to talk about the ones that didn't necessarily go your way. But one of the ones I have in question with – was in 2014 against Cormier and we've talked about Daniel tonight why did you lose that fight in the fashion that you did and it was he was it just his night was it something that broke down in training camp was it was it mental preparation give me an idea of why because I didn't want you to lose that fight yeah. and I know you didn't want to either but why did you lose that fight that night to Cormier well I think uh style this styles is a big thing of it I'm a I'm a wrestler that likes to punch and he's a, a really good freestyle wrestler that that's, you know, smart when he fights and, and he fought me exactly how he should have. And, and he fought me exactly how I expected him to fight me, come out and just try to take me down the whole time. And, and that's what he did. And I expected to be able to stop his takedowns a little better than I, than I did. And, and, you know, I did expect to be taken down and, you know, I, I, didn't do a good, good as good of a job getting up as I thought I'd be able to get. He he's uh he was a lot heavier and and as a wrestler that that can control and keep guys down, that's what we've been doing our whole lives. You know, he does that really well, puts his weight on you real well. So he seemed twice as heavy as he was and and, and as it was that night he was probably you know, almost 30 pounds heavier than me that night. I mean, it, we weigh in the day before. I think I weighed in at 199, and he had to weigh in at, at 206. And he told me, I think he said fight night, he was in the 227, 228 range. So he gained 20 pounds overnight just in water weight pretty much? Or yeah, over 20 pounds. And, and, and I uh, I was probably a little lighter than I was because I don't eat much fight day. And I weighed in at 199 eating lunch, you know, so – the day before i was just light because i had just come off a a fight i think it was the second fight with shogun in brazil and i wasn't even back from brazil yet and they offered me this fight six weeks later seven weeks later so i was i was already pretty lean from training hard for that fight and went right back into training camp and and it's hard for me to keep weight on when when i'm training that hard it, it, I never cut weight at all for 205. You never cut weight. And and w with that with a, with a loss on your on your record to a guy like Cormier, when you see each other now, you run into each other, is it just like a respect of like, hey, it was just like a wrestling match that could have went either way. It, you know, he had the upper hand that night, he was the better man that night, or is it something to where he took did it give him an ego over you? Did you ever see an ego with him after he beat that or was it still ultimate respect for you no i think he he's always been very respectful and and you know it it, it just was it was we both came from the wrestling background and we compete against guys all the time that we hang out with in wrestling and and you know this was no different to us he just happened to beat me up that night and uh did a better job you know with his game plan um <laughs> Sometimes I wonder this question, it just hit my mind, is like when I'm watching a UFC fight and, and Bruce Buffer does his deal before the fight and the animation, the energy, the it's time, and, and then when he points to the fighter, have you ever like busted out giggling or anything like when he's doing that or was it like you knew it was happening so you didn't, but it's almost hard to keep a straight face sometimes, right? Oh, he's, he's definitely cracked a few smiles on my mouth uh, <laughs> right before I fight, you know, just watching him. He uh, and I love Bruce. He's an awesome dude, and and it's just funny, you know. He, he puts the energy and and practices his moves and and how he turns around, and and he. 
puts that work in so he can have that energy. He he feels like the cameras are on him only and he has to make sure that he's doing everything perfect and he's that entertainment. And and that's what it it just helps drive the whole energy of the whole event he's up. Awesome. And, and yeah, he is absolutely awesome. I could see him like with a BG Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Fever record on, just total John Travolta and out to some disco music. And <laughs> that's just the way I just, I, I bet you in the 70s, he was just a disco <laughs> ball maniac. Let me ask you about another UFC personality. As far as, and, and I know you're always good at saying, you know, that like what you said about Bisbin, you know, you got to respect the, the fact that he trained hard. He took his fights and his opponents serious. What is your opinion of Joe Rogan? Um, you know, he's another man that's, you know, 50, 51 years old now. He started hunting six years ago with his bow, got into archery big time. Loves, he's always promoting hunting now and elk and eating elk and cooking elk and eating wild game and living off the land. But besides that, to me, he comes off as a, I hate to throw around the word genius, but when it comes to like color commentary of a fight, he seems to really have a good grasp on the fight game. Am I right? No, absolutely. I think uh, he's definitely, I think by far the best commentator out there. <clears throat> There's a lot of other good ones that guys that I love as well. Goldie is awesome, and I can't believe that he's not with the UFC anymore. But I think he's pretty happy where he's at with Bellator as well. But you know, I think Joe Rogan is just uh, he has certain energy he says a lot of things that are off the wall he's very knowledgeable about the sport um you know i i think you can't really say too many negative things about his commentary you know occasionally you can tell when he uh he likes somebody that that he's commentating for you know he kind of skews uh skews the commentary towards that guy and and, you know i'm sure i i been on both sides of that with him, you know, depending on who I'm fighting. But yeah, I don't think I could do it without being, you know, kind of having a favor of watching a fight and commentating on it. You know, it'd be tough to, to pretty state, stay neutral, at least for it on air. But you know, he's, uh, definitely, I think, uh, been a big part of, you know, making sure that the fans enjoy the, the broadcasts. I, I believe so too, and it's funny because you know he's a stand-up comedian also, and he right. uses a lot of profanity in his stand-up. No, for sure. So it's funny to have you know he's really got to calm that down on pay-per-view. He can't just go out there and f and this and f and that. But well, you know, like, pay-per-view it's not as important as is on, on Fox. But Dana White doesn't tame it down at all for for pay-per-views, but Foxy does. That's a good point, and he gets beeped out a lot on the Ultimate Fighter, which you were a coach on at one time, right? And you coached against Bisping, yeah, and. Was it the hardest six weeks or whatever of your life to be in the gym or on camera with that dude on a daily basis? No, we, we, I wasn't really in the gym with them. They would leave as we were getting there. They, they'd make sure that we would cross paths a few minutes, you know, a couple times a day, a few minutes each time. And, and uh, you know, unless we had, you know, we're picking fights or something where we all had to be there at the same time, I didn't really see him much and, and you know. I still had the opinion about him, you know, that he was a douchebag, but. <laughs> so that it didn't change getting to hang out or like once in a while, they'll like bring the both teams together to a sushi restaurant. And you gotta say, I don't know if you guys did that. I think, I think Sarah and Matt Hughes or somebody at one time did that. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be fun. But is that, is that deal real reality TV or is it like, do they, is it, is it built in drama? Or what do you got on that? No, I think everything that they show ha- actually happened on that show, and, and whatever you you know, sometimes they put it a little bit in a different context, but you know, or or sometimes in in a little bit out of order, but you know, for the most part, they did a good job during my season. Um, uh, that's what happened, you know, pretty much. Do you, do you think that? Um, and I'm just I'm just going back here because I'm a. I, 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 I'd like to think I'm a fight fan, but the tap out air and, and, and skyscraper and, and um, were you that they had their reality TV show. And that was kind of like this, like the spark of, of, you know, these guys traveling across the country, kind of like what Dana does now with looking for a fight. Right. And you know, it's, it was a cool concept. They go to these gyms, you know, they'd be with Greg Jackson or they'd come here to, to Rick's place in Reno, whatever. And they'd find a local fighter. Then they would take him to a promotion and help, help, 
b instrumental was tap out in the in the heyday and the golden era of MMA, which I consider like that 02 to, and I know you're a trailblazer and you were fighting, that was a big part of your career, but like 03 to 09 maybe was my favorite time in the fight game. How instrumental was tap out in that? And when Mask got killed in the car wreck, what was that devastating to the MMA world? Well, obviously his death was felt by the MMA world. He, you know, he was a good guy and, and you know, was passionate about our sport and, and did help promote our sport, you know, as best he could. And, and, you know, I don't know if the word instrumental is, is the right word to, to, for their role in that, but they definitely played a big part of that point of history in our sport. And, you know, just, uh, having the name tap out out there kind of got people to talk about, yeah, our sport a little bit more and, and wearing the t-shirts and, you know, people ask, what's that? You know, and this is when our sport wasn't as popular as it is now, not even close. And, and they got in right at the beginning and, and stuck with it, sponsored a lot of guys. My UFC 100 fight against Bisbang, I walked out to a tap out shirt, um, you know, and, and I think that was their biggest selling shirt they've ever had. For real? Yeah. Against Bisbang. And now there's no more. I mean, is tap out gone? Yeah, tap out's gone. They, they, uh, you know, kind of got. I think it might have been the the economy, and and right as the economy was starting to tank, they were in the middle of spending a, way too much money on different marketing things and and things they were trying to do and build, and and just kind of got stuck uh, in a house of cards, and you know, it didn't go so well. Because it seems like the, at, at that heyday, there was, there was them and there was affliction and if i know affliction's still around but as far as the fight game goes it seems like the ufc achieved with what i don't know if they wanted to do it but now that everybody's in this reebok contract and wearing reebok stuff in and out of the ring and when they're promoting the fights it's like you don't see that much anymore I remember it was american fighter for a long time and it was affliction and it was tap out and you had your you know you were with clinch gear for mm -hmm. a long time to me, it's almost sad, kind of, that all these brands help build the sport, and then goodbye. You know, you better you better hold on now, or what? Yeah, the, I mean, even before the the, the Reebok deal, the, the UFC really put a put a stranglehold on a lot of them. They started charging money to be able to to have the right to sponsor fighters, and, and do in doing that, some of these companies that they're not making that much money, and in, in, in clothing, it, it's tough to do, and and for for them to be able to pay fifty or a hundred thousand dollars to the UFC basically means that they're gonna be paying the fighters that much less. And you know, it it just was uh taken directly out of the fighters' pockets when they started doing that. Now you you brought up another name that I remember um when you just talked about walking out in the tap out shirt for the Bisbing fight being the number one selling shirt potentially in tap out history. Stitch was kind of a, a, a staple. You know, he'd come out and he'd put the, you know, he'd rub you down and make sure that you were, that everybody was safe going in the fight, check your eyes, make sure. I don't know everything that he did, but he, he had some style. He had a personality. And then all of a sudden the UFC sells or he speaks out against the Reebok deal or something happened to where he was just smoked. And I was like, man, that was, where'd Stitch go? Did you, did you, did you have yeah, a relationship with Stitch? Yeah, Stitch. Great guy, one of the best cut men out there. You know, I, I can't say if he is the best, but I didn't have that many cut, you know, cuts in my career at all to really need one. But occasionally, but yeah, you know, they would wrap your hands, and you would over the years develop uh, a friendship with some of these guys. And and it was pretty sad that the UFC just let them go the way they did. And and uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was for something that he, you know really shouldn't have been let go for when i when i think back over the last few years of of the ufc and we're coming down to the end of this dan i can't tell you how much i appreciate you being here on the podcast and um i was i was guilty of this opinion back when it first started even you know before ronda was ronda i didn't want to see girls in the octagon fighting i was like man they don't have a place in this not in a sexist way but like can they really do what guys do? Or can they really go in there and entertain a fight crowd? Because 
you know, you see it a little bit in wrestling. You saw it a little bit in, you know, the high school wrestling, a little tiny bit in collegiate, and maybe a little bit in Olympics in the past. Judo, you saw more female interaction. Ronda Rousey comes in and kind of becomes this, like, icon in a hurry, in my opinion, too, in too fast. She grew too fast, got famous too fast, da 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 she, whatever. But do you like the female fight game? And is there a place for it in the sport? And do you see it becoming stronger and stronger? Or is somebody finally going to go, enough is enough. These girls are beating the hell out of each other. Am I wrong to think that way? Or do you appreciate the female fight game? No, I definitely appreciate the female fight game. Um, you know, and I think uh, they're, they're not going anywhere. I think it's only going to get more popular the, the more girls that get into it. There's a ton of girls that want to get into it and, you know, slowly start training and learning. And then they want to go and compete in, in jiu-jitsu or whatever and, and maybe do an amateur fight and then, the, you know, it depends on each individual. But I, I don't think, see it going anywhere. And, and, you know, I'm definitely entertained by it. I, I coach uh, a couple girls at, at our gym and you know, on our team. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, they definitely have earned their, their, their spot in the sport and they're only going to get better. I mean, it, wrestling was the same way. We never used to have women wrestling, you know, when I was growing up wrestling and then, uh, they started getting in there and, and, you know, it was, uh, one of those things that didn't quite look the same as, as guys wrestling right at first, but as they, as a couple of years went by, you know, they slowly became, you know, technically as good as the guys and, and were able to do the same things as the guys. So I, it, they definitely have uh, proven that, that it could work in wrestling, and, and MMA is no different. Very well said. Even with the weight difference, would you take a fight against Brock Lesnar? Did he deserve to be in the UFC? And would you knock him out if you fought him, you know, <laughs> five years ago? I'm asking because you hear this in the – we talked about country music or music. You have these talent shows. And you got this guy that goes on American Idol and he wins American Idol. He gets a record deal right away. Uh, and then you got guys in Nashville that have been coming up in the honky tonks like Toby Keith did for years. I remember Toby Keith came here back in like 92, 93 and played their nugget rib cook off with a mullet and saying, I should have been a cowboy. And nobody even knew who the heck he was. And he earned his stripes. And then you got these guys that win these talent shows and boom, they're right there in the midstream and the mainstream of it and getting record deals and selling records and sometimes get a number one hit on the radio. Brock Lesnar's over in the WWE. Yes, he was a talented wrestler. He wrestled collegiately, and he's in this what we call, you know, wrestling world. He gets invited over for UFC 100 to fight against Frank, or I think his first fight was against Frank, Frank Muir or yeah. something. Did you respect the fact that he could come straight from the WWE into the UFC? Or what, how, were, how does a fighter think on something like that? Well, yeah, I absolutely respect the fact that he could. You know, he obviously was a good wrestler, and – He's enormously huge and strong, uh, you know, but there's other aspects to that. Uh, you know, I think it would have taken him a lot longer to, to kind of do more. I don't think they should have ever given him a title fight with being having a two and one record or whatever he had. Um, it just disrespected the title, you know, to do that. And, and yeah, I don't know, um, you know, and then for him to just come in at UFC 200 and, and, get paid what he got paid compared to all the other guys that were on the card and then leave, leave. And, and yeah, I don't know, just kind of had not the best attitude about, about it. Just saying, yeah, I just went and got paid, you know, wasn't what all these other guys that, that bust their ass every day and trained to get the type of payday he got and that are a lot more entertaining than he is in fighting in MMA uh, yeah, I just think that it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I want to ask you this before we leave today. I'm just going to ask you a couple quick power questions as far as when I say power, just just give me quick answers. And I just I want to know, you know, your opinion on these things. And if you don't want to answer, just tell me. But would, would Hoist Gracie have a shot against today's talent pool? to do what he did. Now, I know he was a trailblazer. And I know he's a pioneer, and the, the Gracie family is huge in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Would he have a chance at his talent when he was back in, in his heyday? 
could he fight the talent pool that's out there right now with the way these guys are training and the the the, the way they're equipped with you know being so well versed in every area of the fight because he wasn't a boxer he wasn't a wrestler he'd get you down he put you in a choke or whatever could he win today no and i think matt Hughes kind of showed that and that was when hoist was still competitive was Hoist competitive when Matty beat him? Because I remember Matt got on him and just punched him out, and they stopped the fight. It was embarrassing, kind of. It was like, and you tell me if I'm wrong on this, but like I look at BJ Penn as like this guy that used to be like this just guy with blood on his hands and would go in there and, and just demolish people. He had a cool career. And then he comes back, and he keeps coming back, and he keeps coming back until the, you're just like, dude, what are you doing? It's almost did, 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 my next question is, did BJ Penn fight himself out of his legacy in the sport by get his, by the way he, presented himself in those last three fights yeah, i don't know I, I don't think you can ever take what, what he accomplished away from him you know I, I think you can leave him with a better memory of you by leaving on a on a good note and not on two or three bad notes you know but i don't think you can you can't take away what he what he accomplished now i know that any fighter on any given night can take a punch and get lit up and be knocked out that's you know that's part of the fight game you've experienced it and you've put a lot of that on people I don't even know how many times you've been hit, but why is somebody like Chuck Liddell looked at as such a badass in his fine career? And I was a huge Chuck Liddell fan, like in that two oh five, oh six, oh seven time frame. He was he was the man. And his his stature, the way he come out, his poses, his haircut, his shorts, the blue, the ice man. Um he got knocked the heck out by Rampage, knocked the heck out by Sugar Rashawn. He did have some good showings against um, you know, against against uh Tito and against Axe Murder and Hanson. Was he that good of a fighter? I know he was a college wrestler, but why was his image, why was he so popular? Was he just that cool of a guy? Well, you got to also think that there was a lot less shows back then and a lot less fighters, and he was one of the top guys the UFC pushed for years, and that's why he was so popular. That and the fact that he was dangerous and he was winning most of his fights, and, and he goes out there and puts it out on all on the line. You know, I, I don't think if you compare his talent to some of the guys now, I mean, and he wasn't, he could have done so much more with what he knew, but he just liked to do certain things. He wanted to just stand and bang with everybody. And, and he was a decent wrestler in college and, and he could absolutely take guys down and change the fight, you know, and, and beat guys up for there for a while and then stand them back up and finish them. But, you know, I think his attitude of I'm going to stand and, and bang with you, one of us is getting knocked out, people like. When you look at your career, when we talked about how you were a pioneer and it pisses you off to see some of the things that happen, I, I love that the way you put that about the whole McGregor deal. When it comes to the smaller fighters, um, they're exciting to watch. They don't get a lot of the same hype a lot of the times that that some of the you know heavyweight or light heavyweight or 170 matchups got in my opinion but when you look at a career of uriah faber as the california kid the the wec days the king of the cage days college wrestling days and what he achieved at, you know at that small weight group staying in shape um living a you know a healthy lifestyle and and really i i think that uriah was awesome at at, at showcasing you uh mma uh, to a smaller guy like hey i'm little but i can i can get in there and bang do you respect a, a, a Uriah Faber in the career that he had? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I was a big fan of his from the get-go, and, and I think I was watching one of his first fights he ever had at, at up in Sacramento at some local show and, and uh, you know, told him a few things of what you need to make sure you work on, especially if you want to get paid. you got to learn how to, to strike, and you, know, you can't just take everybody down and, and hump them. So, you know, I think uh, – he has done done quite a bit and, and had the talent to do it and, and worked hard and, and had the right attitude. You gotta love his attitude about everything. He's he's positive, doesn't talk crap on people for the most part and, and you know, just says it how it is and uh yeah, I th I feel like he's represented the sport really well. I love hearing you say that. Last last little comment I'll make question Dan is if if you were sitting in a gym full of 15 year old kids that are starting their high school career and some of them may have been wrestlers growing up, but a lot of them have caught on to this MMA 
not hype, but the, I mean, MMA is for real. It's legit and it's talent and it's dedication and commitment and especially discipline, all the different disciplines of it. But to be successful at it, you got to be a lot. You got to do a lot of different things from the training to the nutrition, to the diet, to, to um, learning the different formats and disciplines like we talked about from jujitsu to, to mu Muay Thai, to boxing, to wrestling. You had a wrestling base. What's the best piece of advice? What's the one piece of advice that you would start a 15-year-old off with? I guess that you would say learn to wrestle. I always tell people a wrestler that can throw hands is the best fighter in the world because a wrestler is a different cat. But what is the one piece of advice you give a, a room full of 15-year-old kids that love MMA and are thinking of telling their mom and dad that they want to get into it? Well, I think uh, even at 15, you, you kind of are a little behind the boat as far as getting in on the wrestling team because you're already in high school at that point. And, you know, wrestling is definitely the best base to have, in my opinion, looking backward. And and the advice I'd give to anybody is, is wrestle, learn to wrestle. But if you want to be an MMA guy, wrestling isn't going to win you fights. You're not going to finish fights. You're, you're going to be able to control the fight, but that's about it. You want to be able to either knock him out or submit him you want to be able to not get submitted and not get knocked out. And, and you got to be able to learn that and just getting a good gym that has a, everything you can, you can wrestle in school or high school and college, but you know, you, you need to go into a good MMA gym that, that has wrestling, good wrestlers, good strikers and good jujitsu guys and, and get in there and learn and have fun with it. Biggest thing is having fun. If I ask you right now what you want for lunch, you want sushi or you want a steak? What kind know. of guy are you, Dan? What do you want? You want sushi you want steak? I've been having a lot of steak lately, so I might go for salad. You want cake or do you want pie? <laughs> do you like cherry pie or do you like birthday cake? Oh, cherry pie. Do you like wakeboarding or water skiing? Water skiing. Do you ever listen to rock and roll or is it all country? I listen to rock and roll. Do you like Guns and Roses? Yes. If I could t pick you one song to play right now with the Axel Man and Slash and Duff, what song would you pick of Guns N' Roses? I don't know. Not even Welcome to the Jungle? Maybe. Rocket Queen? Dan, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm, I take a lot of pride in knowing you, um, watching you as a fighter. Um, I would like you to sign my heavy bag. Uh, if you will, um, if that's not asking too much. And then I was thinking after lunch we do a cross-branding of you teach me how to throw an H-bomb and I teach you how to blow a duck call. Okay, we can do that. Do you think I have anything in my body that I could ever land a punch like that? Well, I, I was just thinking when you asked me to sign your heavy bag that the signature will probably stay there forever because you won't be able to wear it off how hard you hit. <laughs> so... You think that I don't have some good hands? Well, let's just go out there and just see if I have some good hands. <laughs> Hendo, for real, the career has been amazing. The, the way that you present yourself, I think that myself and being in the position I am and what I do, I've learned so much more, you know, seeing how you present yourself in front of a crowd, in front of a, the hype of a fight, uh, to build a fight, the way you presented yourself in the ring, the way I've seen you present yourself in public, the way you treat your family, the way you treat your friends. Um, it's not saying this like in passing, like you are somebody that people need to look up. They need to, they need to live their lives more like you. I'm not saying that you're perfect, but if somebody could have the discipline that you've had to do what you've done for the sport of MMA, the lifestyle of MMA, and now you're raising a family, you're getting kids involved in the outdoors, the conservation. We fell in love with duck hunting. You know, you did in Oklahoma, we're going to go again. You're in conservation, outdoors, eating wild. Everything that you do, I think you're doing it right. Again, we all have hiccups. I'm not sitting here saying Dan Henderson's the almighty, but it's kudos to you on an unbelievable career. Congratulations on the career. Congratulations on the fight going into the Hall of Fame. And anything that you ever get involved in, we're going to watch. We're going to be fans of. And I truly appreciate you being here today. Oh, well, I thank that. Thank you for that. I mean, it means a lot. But, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I, I don't consider myself all that that awesome but it's good to hear it sometimes from other people that, that you're doing the right things and, and um, I'm just trying to be the best guy I can well I think it shows I think that even after a few years since retirement a couple of years I was at the Hard Rock Casino with you for a, a dinner at Nobu back in January with Benelli with George again from Benelli and it took me and you, because of you, it took us an extra 20 minutes to get into the restaurant because when we walked from one point to the next, no, there was no fight in town that week.
that was the AVN awards as a matter of fact, but to see the people put their arms around you and ask you for pictures and autographs and hugs and, and they were calling you champ. And I mean, it was literally like, it was being around a celebrity in your world and you've earned it. So at this time, Tom plays a song called the money all gone. It plays us out. You're going to meet Leith Lofton today. He's going to come in and sing on another podcast, but he's playing our concert tomorrow night. He wrote that song with our good buddy, Drake white. And I think that your career was built on the words of this song is that you didn't chase money. You didn't chase, you didn't chase credibility or uh, popularity or celebrity. You, you treated the sport, you put the sport first and just like you put your friends and family first. And when you hear this song, this is, probably written about somebody that's lived their life like you so my man i appreciate well, you thank you thank you hendo good luck and what's coming next the brewery the restaurants everything that you got going on team quest um dan henderson fitness temecula california you can find dan on instagram at dan henderson dan hendo dan hendo i follow him he's got red white and blue shorts on reminds me of apollo creed and rocky four right before he went out and got knocked the you know what out by ivan drago but then rocky went to russia train remember he had the the telephone poles running in the snow yeah and then eye of the tiger came on i wish we had eye <laughs> of the tiger playing right now dan henderson hendo pioneer trailblazer in the game of mma look for him on upcoming episodes of the foul life that we filmed in oklahoma with blue and carson and the guys at flatline outfitters we're excited to have him. He's wearing a bandit hat today, shoots a Benelli Super Black Eagle 3, and he's an unbelievable representative of our lifestyle. Dan Henderson, thank you very much. Tom, go ahead, play a little bit of Haas, Leith Lofton. Thank you guys for joining us on another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody.